Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Grazing cattle on wheat, of course, is very popular in Oklahoma, but as we all know, Mother Nature sometimes has other plans and wheat crops don't always work out. Today we head to Logan County to learn about another forage option. Our main focus is wheat pasture. Um, we try to, to have cattle grazing on it through the cool season and we use it as a cool season forage. That is our plan. We'll take them all through graze out or we'll turn it into a bale of hay. We thought that we had uh, our wheat found and that the uh, uh, germ test would be good and it ended up not being so we went with another route and that was our, our quickest route was to go to oats. Oats, you know, is a really good rescue crop. It, it's one of the fastest growing crops as far as the small grains that we have available to us. Uh, we can get a tremendous amount of growth in a short amount of time. For us this year it was a catch-up crop. We were uh, or a makeup crop. Very clearly we did not do this the right way. We, we didn't plant it right. We didn't have our ground necessarily prepared, but the oats recovered from it. Um, we were pushed in front of a rain, and we were afraid that we would be in a cycle where we might be two weeks where we wouldn't be able to get back into the field again, and then not have a chance to have that early grazing. So we got lucky. We had a tremendous amount of growth. They grew a lot faster than our wheat did, and we were able to stock these acres a lot heavier than we were our wheat acres. Oats are the most palatable of our small grains. Um, cattle will, or other livestock will prefer those over uh, rye and wheat and, and uh, nearly everything else. They're really high in protein, uh, very similar to wheat pasture, you know, 25 to 30 percent crude protein. And uh, the, uh, when, when it's just leaf, whenever it starts getting mature, you know, it, it'll get down into the lower 20s and, and upper teens. Uh, the problem is it's not winter hardy. Uh, this, this has been tromped pretty hard with the wet weather that we've had since Christmas. Uh, it needs some time to recover. We've, we've had some uh, freeze damage from it uh, that we wouldn't have had if we would have had wheat pasture. But this one, this time, and I'm not going to say it's going to be every time, but this time the oats, we were able to uh, stock considerably heavier. We stocked about 700 pounds of beef to the acre. We're not through the growing season yet. Clearly um, the calves are catching the oats right now. If we can get to March then we've we've essentially doubled our stocking rate. We've been looking at uh, getting anywhere from 2.4 to 2.8 pound gains on cattle. Uh, we shipped some a uh, week or so ago. We can't complain with how the production has been. You know they, when they were able to get cattle out, they were at, in more than double what we would see in, in a lot of wheat pasture situations. And, you know, cattle gaining 2.4 you know, to, or 2.5 to 3 pounds a day is, is really outstanding for that amount of livestock to, to have on the field. My dad told me a long time ago, he said, dust wheat in, mud oats in. We've had a pretty muddy year, so um, it worked. We're with our cropping system specialist, Josh Lofton. And Josh, we just heard from a producer who's been grazing his cattle on oats. How popular is that in the state? Oats are actually a really popular option. Um, uh, a lot of folks like, like oats due to the, the flexibility in the system that it provides. Um, if, if a grower goes in and plants, plants their wheat and it fails out in the fall, or, or maybe they didn't get a chance to plant their wheat in the fall, uh, oats provide us a really good option of going in in the spring, um, and, and putting in a forage crop, that way those cattle can go in uh, the back half of the spring and, and actually get pretty decent forage production. And most of the time in a failed wheat crop, we're, we're gonna go in into more of a no-till situa situation. Compared to if you didn't get wheat in the fall, we might be in, into more of a tilled situation. When we look at, at a lot of our planting practices, they are very similar to wheat. Um, and, and some of our things like uh, seeding rate and, and seeding depth are gonna depend on which, which one of those two you're in. In regards to the quality of forage, is it better than wheat or is wheat better? How does, what do you think? It's really six and one, you know, they're, they're really going to like it. You know, it's, it's in a period to where there's not a lot of green stuff growing. So getting a good oat crop out and established is, is pretty good. It's definitely better than the failed wheat crop. The, the benefit that the oats provide is, is um, if growers do end up planting it in the spring, it can get that very rapid forage production that, that those cattle can use uh, rather quickly uh, during that, that critical time uh, coming out of, out of the winter. Are oats specifically for cattle or do they use them for other animals? Well, and, and that's very interesting because we have quite a few growers in the state that, that aren't necessarily grazing their oats, but they're taking them to seed. Um, you know, 
we're really big in the horse industry here in the state of Oklahoma. You know, we, we have oats being supplied to the horse industry. Also, the cover crop industry really loves oats. And, and I do believe we have several growers in the state that are growing oats uh, for seed supplies for the cover crop industry uh, to, to take to uh, back into Oklahoma or various other states uh, in the U.S. Let's switch gears a little bit and move to the winter crops. Um, how are uh, wheat and canola coming along? Actually, they're looking pretty good. Um, we're, we're looking real nice. Uh, it's, it's funny to say this time last year we were asking for more and more rain. Uh, now I think a lot of our growers are glad to see a little bit of drying temperatures. Uh, we had quite a few fields that were, were heavily inundated with water and so as, as some of those are starting to dry up, we're starting to see some of that wheat and canola come through a, a little bit more. Uh, we will probably be in that situation coming out of these next couple weeks to where the nitrogen demand is fairly high. Um, so if you do have your enriched strips, now's the time to start looking into them. Um, so you, but you also have some uh, information about the All Crops Conference. Talk a little bit about that. We're, we're going to be uh, about 10 days away from our All Crops Conference. And, and I know we've been harping on this a lot this, this year, but this is, this is something new that we're doing. And we're calling it kind of that one-stop shop that, that anybody involved in Oklahoma production agriculture can come and, and learn something that they, they want to hear. Um, we have really, really good topics, really, really hot topics and very broad information available. Um, you know, so if you wanna know what's, what's happening with the Farm Bill and the implementation of that, we have Dr. Amy Hagerman that's gonna be talking about that. We also got a special guest, Jimmy Emmons, gonna come talk about conservation ag in his production system and how it's improved that greatly. As well as we have basically all the commodities that we grow in the state are going to be represented uh, in, in topics and discussion uh, there at the Crops Conference. All right, thanks, Josh. Thank you. If you would like some more information about oats and the All Co Crops Conference, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. As the spring calving season is getting underway here across the Southern Plains, it's time to remind producers that the nutritional needs of beef cows actually are undergoing quite a, a sizable change as we go from that dry pregnant cow to now a lactating cow. Let's use an example of a 1200 pound uh, cow before she calves. And when we look at her nutrient needs, well, we need every day for her to consume about 1.9 pounds of protein and something close to 13 pounds of what we call TDN. That's the energy component of the feed. When she's, after she calves and starts to lactate, those uh, particular numbers change rather dramatically. For protein, it goes up about 52%, up to 2.9 pounds of protein every day. And in case of energy, it goes up about 30% from that uh, roughly that 13 pounds that we talked about up to uh, near 17 pounds on an everyday basis. Now, a lactating cow will consume more voluntarily than she did uh, as a dry pregnant cow. But that increase in terms of voluntary intake is only an increase of about 20%. So as we think about those numbers, You've got an only a 20% increase in intake, but the needs for protein have jumped by 52% and energy has increased by 30%. That means to me that the quality, not only the quantity, but the quality of her diet needs to increase as well. Let's use that same example, that 1200 pound cow. If she's been consuming, uh, say, just ordinary uh, average uh, quality grass hay and some 30% crude protein supplement, then we would need to increase her daily intake of that uh, supplement about three and a third pounds every day to meet those protein needs. And that three and a third pounds of, of increased protein supplement would go a long way to meeting the increased needs that she has for energy. So by doing that then, we would be uh, getting that cow the correct amount of nutrients that she needs on an everyday basis to maintain her body condition, produce milk, and go ahead and recycle and rebreed on time for next year's calf crop. So as we go through this calving season, let's keep in mind the nutrient requirements of these beef cows do change as they go from a dry pregnant cow 
to a lactating cow. I'd like to see that change begin gradually in the last part of gestation so it don't have to just make the entire change overnight. But I do think it's important that we understand the differences between the needs of that dry cow and the lactating cow. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, nutrient needs of beef cows, go to the SUNUP website. There we'll have under the show links a link to an, an excellent extension circular done here at Oklahoma State and it's just nutrient requirements for beef cattle give you a lot of information about what cattle in different classifications will need throughout the year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. There really hasn't been much movement in the price of wheat this year, Kim, this calendar year. How, how does that how does that compare to a year ago at this time? Well, let's go all the way back to September of uh, 2018. Uh, wheat prices were around uh, $5.08. They uh, had peaked at uh, $5.75 in early June, and then they went down. Uh, you come into the February time period, uh, wheat prices, the cash wheat price was uh, $4 with a 64 cent under basis or minus 64 basis. Uh, you could forward contract wheat for harvest delivery at $4.25 or 70 cent under basis. You look at right now, our wheat prices are around $4.85. $4 you can forward contract uh, for uh, uh, $4.80. You got that basis uh, last February, minus 64. Now it's a minus 14 cents. Uh, our forward contract basis now 35 cents under. Uh, last year it was 70 cents under. So uh, we're about 70 cents higher prices. That 70 cents, what, what, what went in to make that market do that? Well, if you, uh, you look at what's going on in the market uh, this time last year, <clears throat> we had an excess of wheat. Now we have an excess of wheat right now, but last year's wheat was very poor milling quality, uh, low protein, <clears throat> hard to find test weight. Uh, the market needed that 18 crop when we got into harvest and when we got there, we had good test weight, better than a 60 pound test weight. We had over 12 and percent protein on the average. Uh, it was a good wheat, the market needed it and it drove that price up to $5.75 for a few days and then back down to that $5 range. So they needed that quality wheat. That's why the prices are higher. Will we see that 70 cent bump between now and harvest, do you think? Well, it's going to depend on a lot of things, and a big part of that is exports. Right now, we have adequate supply of milling quality wheat. Now, it's they're predicting that we're going to use more wheat this year than we produced last year, and if that's the case, then we'll be short of protein. They'll need that protein, and they'll bid that price up. And if the har we harvest a better than 12.5% protein wheat with better than 60-pound test weight with good exports this spring, we could see that 70-cent price increase. Now there's a lot of ifs in there. Say we don't make those ifs. Say we don't have that protein that we that they need. Will will we see any movement in the price? Well, I think we'll still see uh, prices about the current levels because yeah. the market's going to need this wheat that that we're harvesting, even though it may not be the protein and the test weight that they want. However, that will go away quickly. And if we don't have protein and test weight, let's say our protein's below 12% on average, our test weight's around 58. 59, something like that, we could lose that 70 cents. Okay, thank you much, Kim Anderson. Like the hat, by the way. Thank you. Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Taking soil samples and running soil test analysis is one of the easiest things you can do as a producer or homeowner to make sure your plants are healthy. Taking the right sample, though, is really important. Make sure that you do the soil sampling process correctly. Now, one of the things that we always recommend when you take a soil sample is take multiple cores. So when we say a core, that is a smaller piece of soil or smaller unit of soil that we take to get a composite. Our recommendation at Oklahoma State University is 15 to 20 cores. Now that composite is the one sample you submit to the soil testing lab to get your recommendations for pH and pK. A lot of people question why 15 or 20, that's a lot of samples and it takes a lot of time. And that's true. When you take that many samples, it takes a significant amount of time to go out there and make sure you get a good sample to get a good composite. 15 or 20 cores is what we need to get a good composite sample. And it really comes back to the statistics. Uh, to discuss some of that, if we look at the number of cores we have per sample, we, so we have number of cores per sample, or per composite sample, if we start off here and say this is one core and this is 30 cores, and we have our line in here, 15, and get it up in here and we have this number. This side is error. 
So if we look, the higher we get on this bar, the further closer to the top we have, the more error we have in the analysis. We draw this out, and this is really indicative of most populations, uh, people, animals, soil samples. If we look at our error and graph it, it looks something about like this, where it's coming down here, and if we only have one or two samples representing a population, so that's just two cores representing an entire field. We've got two little soil samples representing an entire field. We have a lot of error. That means that even though the field might have an average pH of six, because of our error, this sample can come back anywhere between a four and eight, just because we take two. The more samples you have, the more you go down this line, the more you reduce that error and make sure that the sample you're actually sending in better represents the whole, it's like taking a population, think you have a hundred people randomly collected from the street and you take two of them to say, my group averages this. What's the likelihood choosing two people out of a hundred is going to best represent the group as a whole? And it's really getting to that 15 to 20 subsamples or 15 to 20 samples of a population does a great job of describing the population as a whole. Does it do it perfect? No but it does an overall good. So that's why as a nutrient management specialist uh, and, and Dr. Zong in the soil testing lab, we really push, let's make sure we get a good number of cores in that composite so we can best describe the area that we're sampling. For more information, check out the SUNUP website at www.sunup.okstate.edu. Welcome, Wes Lee with the weekly Mesonet Weather Report. Weather is the driving factor for most decisions made on the farm. For example, in dual purpose wheat, the decision to remove cattle early enough so the grain crop is not severely damaged is weather related. Research has shown this is best done at what is referred to as first holostem. First hollow stem is when the seed head moves up from the crown and leaves below it about a half an inch of hollow stem. If cattle are not removed then, they stand the chance of damaging the head as they graze. Mesonet has a tool to help determine when first hollow stem is likely to occur. It is based on accumulated soil heat units since December 22nd. Wheat varieties are divided up into early, middle, or late maturing. Looking at this week's map for the early varieties shows that first hollow stem is likely occurring in the southern half of the state. Even further north at Kingfisher, first hollow stem is likely to begin within the next week on early varieties. For more information, visit our website at mesonet.org. Next up, Gary will be discussing the increasingly dry conditions in the southwest. Thanks, Wes, and good morning, everyone. As Wes was discussing the first hollow stem, it makes us get a little bit antsy about the drought monitor and where we're at for this time of year as we start to head into spring. Let's get right to the new drought monitor map and see what we have. Most of the map still looks great for Oklahoma. We just have that lingering bit of abnormally dry conditions down in the far southwestern part of the state. Uh, we are starting to get worried about the far western panhandle. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but so far, we're looking pretty good for uh, mid to early February. As we look at the consecutive days with less than a quarter inch of rainfall map from the Oklahoma Mesonet, this is where we can see those problem areas. Now the lighter oranges are problems. They, we do need moisture in those areas. Uh, but it's the darker orange areas in the far southwest and also out in the panhandle that we're really concerned about. It's been more than 40 days in those areas without a good rainfall. So those are spots to keep an eye on. Now if we look over the last 60 days, uh, the percentage of normal rainfall map from the Mesonet, again that area down in the far southwest really shows up quite well as a problem area. Uh, a little bit of dryness up in the northwest and also in the far western panhandle uh, but by and large, most of the state over the last 60 days is doing pretty well. But before we panic about our little bit of yellow down in the far southwestern corner of the state, and that area does need rainfall, we have to compare what we had last year at this time. So as we see on last week's map, it has increased a little bit this week, but not even a full percentage point of abnormally dry conditions. And then you look at a year ago, the January 23, 2018 map, 
we had nearly 100% of the state covered in at least moderate drought, uh, and a lot of that was the uh, severe to extreme drought, uh, especially across the western portions of the state where that uh, winter wheat crop is so important. Well, that's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. We are quickly turning the corner toward wildfire season in Oklahoma, and this week we want to revisit a portion of an entire show we did on the topic last year. Today's subject is prevention. Wildfire is a fire that's out of control, something that we didn't anticipate, it's not something we wanted, and um, it's kind of escaped any control and is problematic. With Oklahoma's weather and how variable it is, you know, we, we see the extremes. We see fires that are on the side of a road that may be stomped out by one person, or we can go to some of the larger wildfires we've had over the last few years that take multiple resources, multiple operational periods to control. So the first step to preparedness is don't wait until the event is ongoing or when they smell smoke in the air. From a landowner standpoint, uh, what we really need to focus on is, is taking actions well ahead of that event. Drew Daly is a fire staff forester with the Forestry Service and works with local jurisdictions in the event of a wildfire. He says just doing regular upkeep on your property can make a huge difference. A brush and low hanging limbs are, are removed, that the firewood not stacked up next to a house. Uh, if you have decks or window wells that uh, leaves and other debris has not blown up into, in there because very often it's not the uh, direct contact with a flaming front that results in a, a structural loss or uh, something of that nature. It's firebrands or embers that are lofted uh, into the, uh, the column that settle out into those areas and then they'll initiate a, uh, a home ignition if you will. While upkeep on your property is essential, producers need to have a plan for their animals as well. Well I think in regards to animals uh, Preparing for the disaster before it comes is the best thing that you can do. And there's a lot of resources that you can find uh, for different organizations that will give you some ideals of what you need to be ready for, things that you need to have on hand. Having in your truck the ability to cut a fence in an emergency or, or those types of things was also important. And it's part of the preparation again. There are also preparational steps landowners can take to help those who are helping save their properties. One thing that gets overlooked very often is uh, ingress and egress. In other words, how can a fire truck, a, you know, which sometimes can be very large, can they make it into your driveway? And you know, basically we're looking at something that's, uh, we want uh, 12 foot wide by you know, 13 or 14 feet high so that we can make ingress and egress out of, that, uh, out of your access to your home and to your other, your other buildings. And then uh, also for in the agriculture community, make sure that you have very visible gates. And uh, that way we can you know, try to avoid cutting fences, you know, whether we need to make access or we're trying to let cattle out so that they can be uh, shuffled out of the way of a, of a, a fast moving fire. A lot of times we think about, oh, the fire department will come protect my home. Well, you get in those big situations a lot of times there's not enough people and resources to go around to protect every home and to do that. So your home needs to stand alone. It needs to be able to defend itself. The only way that we can really be prepared is to run through scenarios in your head. Look at lessons learned. Look at other fires that have happened in the state. You know, what, what did the homeowners there go through and what, what did it look like? We try to have our landowners and homeowners to think about what they will do in an emergency. When the emergency occurs, then it becomes second nature. The most important ectoparasite in the United States in poultry is the northern fowl mite. Uh, the northern fowl mite becomes a problem in winter. Uh, usually we start to see it in December through March. Uh, it's about one millimeter in length. It has long legs, an oval body. Depending on whether it has just fed or not, the color varies from white to gray to black. The life cycle of this mite takes from five to 12 days. That's from an egg all the way to the adult. 
It spends its entire life on one host unless it gets uh, knocked off or something like that and it can survive for a period of three to four weeks off the host. Clinical signs that we typically see are going to be some scabby areas on the skin, maybe some crusty uh, dried blood, that type of lesion. You're going to usually see it around the vent. If you'll part the feathers in that area and look at the skin, that's where we'll usually find this mite. You may actually be able to see it uh, crawling around or it may actually crawl on your own uh, hands and bite you. The mite is transmitted from uh, bird to bird. Uh, it's in the environment because it's common in wild birds. It can be found on rats. So it's not like if you have backyard chickens that your chickens are not going to be exposed to this mite. There are several treatments that are approved. Uh, I would contact a veterinarian and talk with them about what's best for you. If you're into organic production, uh, the University of California uh, entomology department there has just done a study a few years ago about the use of sulfur in bags. Uh, they place the sulfur in bags tied into in uh, pens and allow these chickens to bump up again that, against that bag and it releases that sulfur onto their body and it has uh, good efficacy. It controls the mites real well. If you'd like some more information about the northern fowl mite and chickens, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.